You went to school, though, for a, a, a long time, huh? Yeah, I went to university. What did you, what, what was your major? Illustration and children's books. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I, I knew that you were an artist, but I didn't know that, um, oh gosh, then it's perfect. What you're doing is perfect. I love it. Though now I've been doing more uh, coloring books than children's books, but I still love it. How's that going? People are, that's kind of a little bit of a, a fad here now, adult coloring books mm. that are intended, I think, to build mindfulness because we're such a stressed out community yeah. over here. <laughs> <laughs> they are pretty trendy here too. So yeah, that's, that's what I do. <laughs> That's wonderful and inspiring too. So we are going to talk about the chapter chapter twenty one, yeah. I think. I have my copy right here. Yeah, chapter twenty one, Lori makes mischief and Joe makes peace. Yes. It's actually a pretty loaded chapter in my opinion. I've been skimming through this book. And then I get distracted because I get sucked into the story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was thinking how this book is like relationship. It's probably my oldest friend. And it's such a wonderful connection to a couple of my grandparents and childhood friends that, you know, I later lost touch with, but still has a sentimental place in my heart anyway. And just like any relationship, it's changed over the years. It's just become a little more mature, a little more thoughtful. And um, there's just something in it for me personally. Every time I read it, something deeper. That's and really beautiful. It is, it is a beautiful story. It really is. And I'm so happy that it exists because... It's just uh, in this last year when I've been sick, um, it was there again. And I thought, huh, you know, I should thumb through this again. And, of course, got sucked in and read the whole thing. And I find that uh, it's hilarious. It's so witty. I love her writing style so much. It's lively. Um, it's... It's just a fun, quick read, but um, it has everything in it, you know? It's grief and hardship and challenge. And it's just, it's kind of like uh, Tom Hanks, you know, how Tom Hanks is famous for being the everyman in his movie so everyone can relate. And I feel like the marches are a lot like that. And probably one of the reasons why this story has endured. But I'm sure there's plenty of psychological reasons that I don't mm. know about it has. But I think that that's why it works for me. Because, like I said, every time I crack it open, it's like, oh, oh my gosh. And I can see why my grandparents liked it, why my grandmothers liked it. And it's just wonderful, wonderful how it makes connections. That's why I'm here with you now. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, I know what you mean, because I think in different parts of my life, when I have read it, it has had some meaning during that time, and then it changes in during different life situations. I think that happens with uh, every book that I read, especially yeah. if they are familiar from my childhood. I think that's why children's books are so important. One of my daughters, my oldest daughter, said that you know, she took she took a psych class at her college and they were discussing the importance of literature and music in creating empathy and how how much how important it is to read and to listen to music for those for that reason and that's a big thing I really feel like that's true for me I feel like yeah, it gives you opportunities to to find
find to experience what it's like to walk in another person's shoes. So that's what empathy is, having imagination enough to be able to do that. Yes, you can relate to the other person, their life and their struggles or their good moments. And maybe that's why I've been thinking about Lori and Joe's relationship, of course, and the Amy problem that crops up for a lot of people. And I think as a younger person, without having a fully developed sense of of what it's like to be another person, the first thing you do is you connect with the person that speaks to your personality most. And then as I've grown and have been able to understand people who aren't as much like me, you know, I relate to the other characters Mm -hmm. more. And I'm more curious about them and wonder more even about the more secondary characters like Hannah and the Hummels and the Kings and the Moffats. Mr. Lawrence is such an important part of the story, yet I never really thought about him that much till this last time. I'm sure we will get into Mr. Lawrence when we are discovering this chapter, because he appears in the end. But I think that's a good point, because I can really tell who is the sister that I identify with most. It's like a lot of people do. I am like Amy, I am like Joe, but for me it just keeps changing or identify with some part of each of them. Yes, absolutely. I can read this first paragraph. So this takes place during the time when Joe and Lori are 15 and I believe Meg is 17. Little Woman Chapter 21. Lori makes mid-chief and Joe makes peace. Joe's face was study next day, for the secret rather weighed upon her and she found it hard not to look mysterious and important. Max (laughs) observed it, but did not trouble herself to make inquiries, for she had learned that the best way to manage Joe was by the law of contraries. So she felt sure of being told everything if she did not ask. She was rather surprised, therefore, when the silence remained unbroken, and Joe assumed a patronizing air, which decidedly aggravated Meg, who in her turn assumed an air of dignified reserve and devoted herself to her mother. This left Jo to her own devices, for Mrs. March had taken her place as nurse and bid her rest, exercise and amuse herself after her long confinement. Amy being gone, Lori was her only refuge, and much as she enjoyed his society, she rather dreaded him just then, for he was an incorrigible tease and she feared he would coax her secret from her. This takes place when Beth has become ill and Amy has been sent to Aunt March. She was quite right, for the mischief-loving lad no sooner suspected a mystery than he set himself to find it out and led Joe a trying life of it. He wheedled, bribed, ridiculed, threatened, and scolded, affected indifference that he might surprise the truth from her, declared he knew then that he didn't care, and at last, by dint of perseverance, he satisfied himself that it concerned Meg and Mr. Brooke. (laughs) Feeling indignant that he was not taken into his tutor's confidence, he set his wits to work to devise some proper retaliation for the slight. So Larry knows that Mr. Brook has feelings for Meg and he keeps this as a secret from Joe, but he kind of wants Joe to find out. Yes, I think that he tells her a little earlier that Mr. Brook has Meg's other glove, right? Yeah. And, oh, I think that that was the, the chapter secrets after she had given her manuscript to the Spread Eagle newspaper. Oh, yes. He found her out, and then they made an exchange of secrets. Once she confessed what she had done, he told 
divulge her the secret that um, he knew where Meg's other glove was, and of course it upset poor Joe. Can't handle any change. I find it interesting that he feels indignant <laughs> and selected. <laughs> he can't keep a secret. Mac, meanwhile, had apparently forgotten the matter and was absorbed in preparations for her father's return. But all of a sudden, a change seemed to come over her, and for a day or two, she was quite unlike herself. She started when spoken to, blushed when looked at, was very quiet, and sat over her sewing with a timid, troubled look on her face. To her mother's inquiries, she answered that she was quite well, and chose she silenced by begging to be let alone. She feels it in the air, love I mean, and she's going very fast, she's got most of the symptoms, is twittery and cross, don't eat, lies awake and mopes in corners. I got her singing that song about the silver-voiced brook, and once she said, John, as you do, and then turned as red as a poppy, whatever shall we do? said Joe, looking ready for any measures, however violent. <laughs> Nothing but wait. Let her alone. Be kind and patient, and Father's coming will settle everything, replied her mother. Here's a note to you, Meg, all sealed up. How odd. Teddy never seals mine, said Joe next day, as she distributed the contents of the little post office. Mrs. March and Joe were deep in their own affairs when a sound from Meg made them look up to see her staring at her note with a frightened face. My child, what is it? cried her mother, running to her, while Joe tried to take the paper which had done the mischief. It's all a mistake. He didn't send it. Oh, Joe, how could you do it? And Meg hid her face in her hands, crying as if her heart was quite broken. Me? I've done nothing. What's the talking about? cried Joe, bewildered. Meg's smiled eyes kindled with anger as she put a crumbled note from her pocket and threw it at Joe, saying reproachfully, You wrote it, and that bad boy helped you. How could you be so rude, so mean, and cruel to us both? Joe hardly heard her, for she and her mother were reading the note which was written in a peculiar hand. My dearest Margaret, I can no longer restrain my passion and must know my fate before I return. I dare not tell your parents yet, but I think they would consent if they knew that we adored one another. Mr. Lawrence will help me to some good place, and then, my sweet girl, you will make me happy. I implore you to say nothing to your family yet, but to send one word of hope through Laurie to your devoted John. Oh, the little villain! That's the way he meant to pay me for keeping my word to mother. I'll give him a hearty scolding and beg him over to beg and bring him over to beg pardon, cried Joe, burning to execute immediate justice. But her mother held her back, saying with a look she seldom wore, Stop, Joe. You must clear yourself first. You have played so many pranks that I am afraid you have had a hand in this. On my word, mother, I haven't. I never saw that note before, and don't know anything about it as true as I live, said Joe so earnestly that they believed her. If I had taken a part in it, I'd have done it better than this, and have written a sensible note. I should think you'd have known Mr. Brooke wouldn't write such stuff as that, she added, scornfully tossing down the paper. It's like his writing, faltered Meg, comparing it with the note in her hand. Oh, Meg, you didn't answer it, cried Mrs. March quickly. Yes, I did, and Meg hid her face again, overcome with shame. Here's a scrape. Do let me bring that wicked boy over to explain and be lectured. I can't rest till I get hold of him, and Joe made a rush for the door again. What always makes me angry in this chapter is that Meg actually replied to this letter. Yeah, she wouldn't have had any reason to suspect being the person that she is and never having experienced this kind of subterfuge before to have second guessed the note yes so so yeah she just fell right into it 
It's typical catfishing. It's really mean. <laughs> yes. I once read an analysis on this chapter and I can't remember the name of the Alcott schooler, but they basically said that if this would happen to any person who is 17 year old today, they would feel as humiliated as Meg does. Yeah. It's a perfectly um, understandable reaction that Lori just doesn't, I mean, he does not think it through. All he's thinking about is how he feels slighted, he felt excluded, and it's about him getting basically getting revenge. Teaching a lesson like, oh, if you're going to leave me out, I'm going to figure it out anyway. And it's like nothing else matters. Yeah, it's really intrusion to Meg's privacy and he doesn't get it. Hush, let me manage this for it is worse than I thought. Margaret, tell me the whole story, commanded Miss March, sitting down by Meg, yet keeping hold of Joe, that she should op- she should fly off. I received the first letter from Lori, who didn't look as if he knew anything about it, began Meg without looking up. I was worried at first, and meant to tell you. Then I remembered how you liked Mr. Brooke, so I thought you wouldn't mind if I kept my little secret for a few days. I'm so silly that I like to think no one knew, and while I was deciding what to say, I felt like the girls in books who have such things to do. Forgive me, mother. I am paid for my silliness now. I never can look him in the face again. What did you say to him? asked Miss March. I only said I was too young to do anything about it yet, that I didn't wish to have secrets from you, and he must speak to father. I was very grateful for his kindness, and would be his friend, but nothing more, for a long while. Miss Smart smiled, as if well pleased, and Joe clapped her hands, exclaiming with a laugh, You are almost equal to Caroline Percy, who was a pattern of prudence. Tell on, Meg, what did he say to that? I actually went to Google Caroline Percy, and... uh, She's a character from a 19th century book called Patronage. By Maria Edgeworth. Yes. Have you read it? Uh, What's that? Have you read it? No, it's like four volumes. I find the idea very daunting. (laughs) (laughs) But I was surprised and pretty delighted to learn that there's a... Uh, a segment in that story where she receives uh, two letters written by the same hand that causes some issues. And so I thought, well, that's hilarious. I mean, of course, only anybody who was familiar with the story would know, and a modern audience would have to do the deep dive. But um, it just broadened my appreciation for her even more that Louisa includes the pop culture in her story and that detail is kind of a big deal I didn't know that but there's a nice intertextuality there that she takes parts of this literature that she was reading and was popular at the time yeah and one of the things, too, that I'm appreciating more this time around is how Pilgrim's Progress, uh, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress fits into this whole thing, how it influenced the structure of the first half of the book. And I, I, I knew it, but I didn't really observe it or study it as much as I have this last, during this last reading. It's pretty genius. That is really interesting. He writes in a different way entirely, telling me that he never sent any love letter at all, and is very sorry that my rocky sister, Jo, should take such liberties with our names. It's very kind and respectful, but think how dreadful for me. So, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's so mean. It's so mean, and I hate to laugh, you know. This doesn't sound like Laurie is in love with Joe. This sounds more like Laurie is teasing Joe as well. Yeah, 
that's what it's all about. It's like, hey, you, you're not telling me what I think I should know, so I'm going to basically torture you. I'm going to torture it out of you mm. any way I can, and it doesn't matter how. As a matter of fact, it's funny to me. He thinks it's funny. Yeah. He just calls it a joke or a prank. <laughs> it's like, no, it's me. Meg leaned against her mother, looking at the image, looking the image of despair, and Joe tramped about the room, calling Lori names. All of a sudden, she stopped, caught up the two notes, and after looking at them closely, said decidedly, I don't believe Brooke ever saw either of these letters. Teddy wrote both and keeps yours to crow over me with because I wouldn't tell him my secret. Don't have any secrets, Joe. Tell it to Mother and keep out of trouble as I should have done, said Meg warningly. Bless you, child. Mother told me. That will do, Joe. I'll comfort Meg while you go and get Lori. I shall sift the matter to the bottom and put a stop to such pranks at once. Away ran Joe and Mrs. March gently told Meg Mr. Brooks real feelings. Now, dear, what are your own? Do you love him enough to wait till he can make a home for you? Or will you keep yourself quite free for the present? I've been so scared and worried. I don't want to have anything to do with the lovers for a long while. Perhaps never, answered Meg petulantly. If John doesn't know anything about this nonsense, don't tell him and make Joe and Lori hold their tongues. I won't be deceived and plagued and made a fool of. It's a shame. I really love Meg in this chapter. She knows her self-worth. Seeing that Meg's usually gentle temper was roused and her pride hurt by this mischievous joke, Mrs. March suited her by promises of entire silence and great discretion for the future. The instant Laurie's step was heard in the hall, Meg fled into the study, and Mrs. March received the culprit alone. Joe had not told him why he was wanted, fearing he wouldn't come. But he knew the minute he saw Mrs. March's face, and stood twirling his hat with a giddy air, which convicted him at once. Joe was dismissed, but chose to march up and down the hall like a sentinel, having some fear that the prisoner might bolt. The sound of voices in the parlor rose and fell for half an hour, but what happened during that interview the girls never knew. When they were called in, Laurie was standing by their mother with such a penitent face that Joe forgave him on the spot, but did not think it wise to betray the fact. Meg received his humble apology and was much comforted by the assurance that Brooke knew nothing of the joke. I don't know about you, but I think that Joe did the right thing to not tell Laurie that she forgave him on the spot. <laughs> That's I probably think he true. Score for a while. I'll never tell him to my dying day. Wild horses shan't drag it out of me. So you'll forgive me, Meg, and I'll do anything to show how out and out sorry I am, he added, looking very much ashamed of himself. I'll try. But it was a very ungentlemanly thing to do. I didn't think you could be so sly and malicious, Lori, replied Meg, trying to hide her maidenly confusion under a gravely reproachful air. It was altogether abominable, and I don't deserve to be spoken to for a month. But you will, though, won't you? And Lori folded his hands together with such an imploring gesture as he spoke in his irresistibly persuasive tone that it was impossible to frown upon him in spite of his scandalous behavior. Meg pardoned him, and Mrs. March's grave face relaxed in spite of her efforts to keep sober. When she heard him declare that he would atone for his sins by all sorts of penances, and abase himself like a worm before the injured damsel, Joe stood aloof, meanwhile, trying to harden her heart against him and succeeding only in priming up her face into an expression of entire disapprobation. Lori looked at her once or twice, but as she showed no sign of relenting, he felt injured and turned his back on her till the others were done with him, when he made her a low bow and walked off with 
not a word. There he is. He's injured again. Like now it's about him. When I was reading this again for this chat, this chapter kind of reminded me of Laura's proposal to Joe. Because there yeah, we he have... No. He just can't take no for an answer. Exactly. <laughs> like uh, he's injured and Joe feels bad for him. And it's like this whole chapter is like once again Joe having these maternal feelings for him like she's his little mother and that's why Joe can't really see faults in Laura's behavior even when he's hurting her sister. As soon as he had gone she wished she had been more forgiving and when Meg and her mother went upstairs she felt lonely and longed for Teddy. After resisting for some time she yelled at the impulse and armed with a book to return, went over to the big house. Is Mr. Lawrence in? asked Joe of a housemaid who was coming down, downstairs. Yes, miss, but I don't believe he's seeable just yet. Why not? Is he ill? La, no, miss. He's had a scene with Mr. Lorry, who is in one of his tantrums about something, which vexes the old gentleman, so I doesn't go nigh him. Where is Lorry? Shut up in his room, and he won't answer though I've been a tapping. I don't know what's to become of the dinner for it's ready, and there's no one to eat it. I'll go and see what the matter is. I am not afraid of either of them. Up went Joe and knocked smartly on the door of Laurie's little study. Stop that, or I'll open the door and make you called out the young gentleman in a threatening tone. Joe immediately knocked again. The door flew open, and in she bounced before Laurie could recover from his surprise. Joe, who knew how to manage him, assumed a contrite expression, and going artistically down upon her knees, said meekly, Please forgive me for being so cross. I came to make it up, and can't go away till I have. It's all right. Get up. Don't be a goose, Joe, was the cavalier reply to her petition. Thank you. I will. Could I ask what's the matter? You don't look exactly easy in your mind. I've been shaken, and I won't bear it, growled Lori indignantly. Who did it? demanded Joe, grandfather. If it had been anyone else, I'd have... And the injured youth finished his sentence by an energetic gesture of the right arm. That's nothing. I often shake you when you don't mind, said Joe soothingly. Pooh, you're a girl and it's fun but I'll allow no man to shake me. Why were you treated so? Just because I wouldn't say what your mother wanted me for. I promised not to tell, and of course I wasn't going to break my word. Couldn't you satisfy your grandpa in another way? No. You would have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I'd have told my part of the scrape, if I could, without bringing Meg in. As I couldn't, I held my tongue and bore the scolding till the old gentleman collared me. Then I got angry and bolted for fear I should forget myself. It wasn't nice, but he's sorry, I know, so go down and make up. I'll help you. Hanged if I do. I'm not going to be lectured and pummeled by everyone just for a bit of a frolic. I was sorry about Meg and begged pardon like man, but I won't do it again when I wasn't in the wrong. He didn't know that. He ought to trust me and not act as if I was a baby. It's no use, Joe. He's got to learn that I'm able to take care of myself and don't need anyone's apron string to hold on by. <laughs> <laughs> it's so full of contradictions, isn't it? He yeah. says it was just a bit of a frolic, but then he was, he claims he is sorry about Meg, and he, and he behaves so, uh, you know, all this indignation all the way through this whole chapter. And yet, he's a man. He's not a baby. <laughs> but he's having a tantrum. Oh. <laughs> but it's like, I wasn't in the wrong. How is that possible? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, his grandfather doesn't, doesn't know anything about the details of the situation, but he knows Lori well enough to know that he was in the wrong about something. <laughs> yes. This is not in any 
Little Woman movies this chapter, but no, it is at, kind of a feel. yeah. But, well, they want to romanticize Joe and Laurie, which is pretty weird in my opinion. But like this is in the BBC Little Woman series in ni- from 1970, and it's really disturbing because it really tries to portray that it was all Meg's fault, which it wasn't. In the 70s version? Yes. <gasps> oh my gosh, I haven't seen that version yet, but that's very 70s of them, isn't it? I agree. 